Coming into the 2010s, Power Rangers was actually canceled. It was over. It was done. There wasn't going to be any more. 2009's Power Rangers RPM was meant to be the finale series for the franchise. And that's a big reason why RPM was so apocalyptic in nature. At that point, Disney was just letting creatives do anything they want with Power Rangers because they were going to end it. However, due to contractual obligations with the toy maker Bandai of America, Disney, the owner of Power Rangers, needed to keep some toy line going. So they were just like, hey, let's just re-release Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, right? It was the season that got us all popular in the first place, right? But the re-release was not what you think. Instead of diving to the nostalgia of it all, which took them about three more years to dive into, they just re-aired the OG series with some added comic book sound effects, graphics, and info dumps. I made a whole video diving into the topic, and to be honest, the show was awkward. As hell. It would premiere on January 2nd of 2010 on ABC Kids, the Saturday morning TV block airing old Disney Channel series from the mid-2000s. And that block was on its final legs, a year from ending away. But this show alongside RPM was the only way to see Power Rangers at the time. As Disney was already taking away Power Rangers from the minds of the kids because, you know, they just got Marvel Entertainment, they're gonna make some blockbuster movies out of them. So they took Power Rangers off of Jetix, didn't air it on Disney XD, and just, hey, let's put it on local channels at 12 p.m. The company toy line had 4 inch figures with birds, megazords that would eventually inspire future toy lines, this mix and morph series with different series combinations of heads and chests and legs, and the rangers would also have bikes, dragons, and phones not seen in the original 90s program. So was this really the end of Power Rangers? Hey guys, Zesta here, and today we're talking about the history of Power Rangers in the 2010s, and that doesn't really start until 2011. But how did the show come back after being cancelled by Disney? In May of 2010, it was announced that Saban Brands, held up by the original owner of the franchise, Haim Saban, would buy back the franchise from Disney for a whopping $43 million. It was then announced that a new 20 episode season would come in 2011 to Nickelodeon, with longtime series producer Jonathan Chacker back in the helm of the show. While the rest of the Power Rangers catalog would be shown on the sister network, Nicktoons. Sometimes when I would go to my dad's house, he would have Nicktoons and they would just be airing like marathons worth of Power Rangers. Those were the good times. There was also a deal adding the Legacy series onto Netflix, which included every season up until then, and was like that on the platform until the end of 2020. The Mighty Morphin Power Ranger reversion would finish airing on ABC Kids, its 32 episode run, on August 28th, 2010. And the series of Power Rangers Samurai would be shown to the public in October of 2010. The series was made quite quickly, actually, considering, you know, the time that Saban bought it and when they aired it, it was less than a year. And in this initial trailer, they would splice up past clips and meanings of the Power Rangers past into the new cast and the future of the series, as well as its future plans for the brand, including video games and feature films. This would also be the first Power Rangers season to be aired in high definition, as every other season before was aired in 4x3 and 480p. Power Rangers was back in the eyes of the general public, and what better way to announce that by showing up in the Macy's Day Parade. The Samurai Rangers made their debut in Thanksgiving of 2010 with a balloon of the Earth behind them for some reason. Promos would air on Nickelodeon in December and the series would ultimately run from 2011 until 2012. Nickelodeon had bought in a format only permitting 22 episodes of a season, so they would use 20 for regular episodes and 2 for holiday episodes, specifically Halloween and Christmas. Now a series of Power Rangers is usually 30 to 40 episodes and we know that 20 isn't really enough to tell a whole Power Rangers story. I mean, they did 10 in the future, but this was 2011, alright? We had to stretch it out. So they instead made two seasons for one team. Kind of like what they did in Mighty Morphin for three seasons, but you know, those were like 40, 60 episodes. Not the same. And there was also kind of like this, you know, Hannah Montana Forever type thing where they added like another word to the title so it could, it's considered a different series. They would add Super to every second season of the Power Rangers show for the decade. The premiere of the series during February 7, 2011 was actually a big event though, being shot at 8pm prime time on the Nickelodeon network, hyped up with the premiere Q&A at The Grove in Los Angeles featuring suit actors and the cast of the series. The show would focus on five teenagers that inherit samurai powers from ancient Japan to protect the world with an army of monsters. While today's people look at it with kind of bad eyes for, you know, diminishing Japanese influence and kind of whitewashing in some ways, at the time it was pretty enjoyed by children of the nation. But fans would look at it just as an okay show? I mean after RPM anything would be mid to the people of Reddit. But on Nickelodeon it would actually be averaging about 2 million viewers an episode. 
It all starts with an intro that's a new version of the original Go Go Power Rangers theme from the 90s. And with the return of Mighty Morphin comedic legend Bulk, now with his best friend son Spike, it added to that 90s touch the show needed for so long. But besides that, when it came to the adaptation of the Super Sentai series Samurai Sentai Shinkenger, which Disney apparently didn't want to adapt because it was too Japanese, well, they followed beat for beat of the Sentai. It was basically a mirror, a copy, a fubu, a dupe, as the kids would say. And during this time, fans on the internet would start to access Super Sentai by their own different means. I can't legally say. They might be watching. And with help from a toy line that featured the return of Automorphin figures from the 90s redone as Samurai figures, alongside Power Rangers classics like the Megazord and the Morpher. Go, go, Power Rangers! Go, go, Power Rangers! You're being a douche. I will hit you. Go, go, Power no, it's not. I hate them. Go, go, no, watch Chuck instead. Stop. Actually, maybe not that. It wasn't that good. But hey, the show reached new heights. There was also the addition of the American exclusive Mega Mode, which was actually used for the first wave of toys. And I remember as a kid, I was looking at it, I was like, these new Power Ranger suits are kind of cool. They were actually just used for the Megazords. Huh? Not really used outside. Womp womp. There was also, of course, Shogun Mode, a battleizer that can be held by multiple Rangers for the first time. And it's probably some of the best battleizers the series have done too but also just used inside the Megazord. Only used once outside in a fire final fight, by the way. But hey, when Nickelodeon aired the show, they originally aired it at 12 p.m. on Sundays. I don't know, I thought that was very weird. I always associated Power Rangers with like Saturday morning cartoons type beat. They would eventually move to 12 p.m. on Saturdays though. They would eventually release a movie in the winter of 2011 called Clash of the Red Rangers, combining two different Shinkenger movies to create one featuring the crossover with one RPM Red Ranger in an uncredited appearance and only in suit. It was also filmed without their six ranger at the time, so there was some bad dubbing in there too. It was kind of a weird movie. But hey, during the time, they were definitely hyping up Power Rangers as something brand new. It was the most exposure the show has gotten since the early days of Mighty Morphin. They tried to bring Power Rangers into the new day. They did some dancing to dubstep. That video still haunts me, by the way. Help. They made a 3D wall mural in the middle of New York City. They started the Power Rangers in Power program, which dropped internet clips with PSAs. They had the Train Like a Ranger series, showing off different poses so for kids to stay healthy. And they also did a nationwide tour in many schools across the country, even donating $10,000 to a school in Arkansas. Or is it Arkansas, huh? A medica split. There was also mobile smartphone games, an action video game for the Wii, a Mega Bloks collab, and so much more. And most of these clips would go super viral on YouTube, like YouTube was the place for viral stuff at the time, and Power Rangers was in that perfect moment where everything Power Rangers would do would just go viral. They even had like a flash mob at a convention once. That was really cool. Didn't they use a wrong helmet though? Bruh. Yeah, they did. How, how did that happen? There was also videos of the Rangers parodying famous album covers, really hitting for that nostalgia bite in the fan base. There was also one video that was pretty weird where they had an ESPN commentator from like SportsCenter like dubbing over different Power Rangers clips, like this is like a top 10 video. <laughs> there was also a big push for like teen magazines too. As they would have the main male actors of the series be featured and interviewed on teen pop culture entertainment sites like Popstar Mag and Clever TV. What's up, Popstar Online? It was like they wanted the next Zac Efron or the Jonas Brothers. They just wanted to make the next teen heartthrob. That didn't really work, though. I think they were, like, nominated for Kids' Choice Award, though. That's it. Speaking of the Jonas Brothers, they actually wanted to do some music too for this new series and that's where we get to the song Everyday Fun. You remember that? Everyday Fun was a song featuring the characters Mia and Antonio, Erica Fong and Steven Skyler respectively, singing a pop song with Antonio's band in the episode He Ain't Heavy Metal, He's My Brother. And they had a whole episode dedicated to the song and even a full music video on YouTube too with three different versions being released on streaming. All of that being next to the dubstep remix. That still haunts me, by the way. 
There was also a new villain character in the show, Decker, played by Ricardo Medina Jr., known to the fans as Cole from Power Rangers Wild Force. And it was unique because returning actors in Power Rangers would usually mean actors, you know, from New Zealand, because the show's been filming in New Zealand since, you know, 03. We would see some people show up from time to time, but Ricardo, he's from Los Angeles. They flew bro out to play a whole new character, not even Cole. Then again, at the time, pop culture and things weren't like linked to multiverses and one person playing one specific character, so we had to give him that. The Decker storyline was also kind of cool. Ricardo Medina went to jail. Also, by the way, you can Google what happened to him. The sequel series Power Rangers Super Samurai was also known for the introduction of Lauren Sheba, who would become the first mainline female Red Ranger, albeit for a short amount of time. There was something interesting happening in 2012 too because there was also the Vortex by CW, a Saban Brands run Saturday morning kids block on the CW. And they would put Power Rangers onto the block just to give it some more spotlight. But not Power Rangers Samurai, no. They would put Power Rangers Lost Galaxy, a show from 1999? Why? Good question. Vortex on the CW was very similar to ABC Kids as a Saturday morning block. Actually, it was one of the last of its kind, as more companies would push towards streaming in the 2010s. They would even promote it by making another version of Power Rangers Dubstep with the Lost Galaxy members. How long will this video haunt me, huh? Good question. The block would run Power Rangers Galaxy until 2013, with the block officially dying off in 2014. But the marketing for Power Rangers was about to go to another extreme because here comes Power Rangers Megaforce celebrating the 20th anniversary of the show. 2012 was definitely laying the ground for nostalgia with Blu-rays of recent seasons and DVD releases of Mighty Morphin and beyond, and especially other Saban shows like VR Troopers and Big Bad Beetleborgs. 2013 also bought us the Legacy Collection DVD set that was shaped like a Power Rangers helmet. There was also the Legacy line of Power Rangers for Bandai of America, which they re-released a lot of old Power Ranger toys, not even just re-releasing, they would recreate and remake toys that looked and played just like they were in the TV show. They actually did a Megazord of it too, using the molds from the 2010 reversion series. They even released new figures too that were in line with the rest of the Power Rangers toy line as well. But what did the main show have at that time? Well, it was pretty confusing. Power Rangers Samurai will be right back as soon as we sharpen our pencils. Comment question of the day, who is your favorite ranger from the 2010s? Personally, I gotta give it to Steel from Beast Wars, all right? Bro is just the goat, or Robo Knight. Bro was rapping. I had a lot of questions about human emotion. They were vexing me, hexing me like some sorcerer's potion. Let me know in the comments down below and leave a like to lock in your answer. 1,500 likes and I'll do some more videos just for you. Now back to Power Rangers Megaforce, four times awesomer than real life. In terms of seasons to adapt, it would have been logical to just do Kaizoku Sentai Gokaiger, as that show was celebrating the 35th anniversary of the Super Sentai, and both shows would have done really good milking the anniversary aspect of it all. But they actually instead went to adapting both the Angelic Ghost Sager series and the Pirate Gokaiger series theme in two years. And apparently this was because Bandai of America didn't really trust angels or pirates to do good in two years, so they were like, let's just do it one year, find a way to connect both teams somehow. They did. Not good though. Saban also really liked the Ghost Sager suits for the fact that it had the original layout of colors for the Mighty Morphin team. It would have been great for the 20th anniversary. But Gokaiger had everything else anniversary wise. Ranger keys, old rangers coming back, Megazords coming back. They had the Legend War, that was a movie in Japan that they were definitely excited to do in America. And there was even a rumor that Toei was actually reshooting the Legend War for Power Rangers in a similar situation as the early 90s when Toei made Zoo Ranger footage for Mighty Morphin, but that didn't actually amount to anything. The marketing year for Mega Force was definitely different from Samurai. It felt like they were already losing hope in the show. Instead of focusing on the main cast and this whole soft reboot of the series in the public, a lot of the marketing focused on the anniversary aspect of it all. The Power Rangers of all seasons would invade New York City with business suits and play basketball too. Which to be honest, those pictures are funny to this day. And of course, they returned for the Macy's Parade with the Megaforce team alongside all the previous Red Rangers, which was pretty cool for fans and all. They also did collabs with Hot Topic to promote MMPR merch in the stores as well as doing a collab with Morph Suits to break a world record of Power Rangers in Paris. 
Yeah, probably not the best marketing. Also, I think I could beat that world record one day. Megaforce tells the story of the evil war star aliens attack on Earth, and the supernatural guardian Gosei, assigned to Earth by the original Mighty Morphin Zordon, not shown of course, he died, and his faithful robot assistant Tenso. By the way, Tenso, best part of the show. Love him. Me and robot characters, we like this. Shout out Steel, we'll talk about him later with five new teenagers of attitude to combat the invading forces. The first episode was essentially a recreation of the original first episode of Mighty Morphin, and that's what a lot of Megaforce felt like, 90s Mighty Morphin show quality in 2013. It was definitely bizarre to say that. I guess I didn't really pay much attention to that because, you know, first thing episode one, they tease us, legendary battle, look at these clips, man. This is a dream that our Red Ranger is happening. We're not gonna explain how he's having these dreams, but he's having them. Uh, we got Ranger keys on the wall. Get excited, Power Rangers. Oh, they're coming back. They're, they weren't back, they were flopping. In 2013, old Power Rangers like JDF, Tommy, the original Green Ranger, was posting pics of this legendary battle on how the Power Rangers version would be like. So fans were definitely excited, definitely not caring about what's happening in Megaforce. 2014's Power Rangers Super Megaforce involves the massive alien Armani Amama. What did he say? <laughs> What did the Green Ranger say to the Blue Ranger? Breathe, man, breathe! <laughs> 2014's Super Megaforce story involves the massive alien army armada, with Gosei giving the Megaforce Rangers new morphers and keys to unlock new pirate-looking powers, with a big gimmick being that the Rangers are able to use any Ranger form, past, future, or alternate universe. The problems fans majorly had was the lack of connection to previous seasons, in a show all about its lore, it didn't really go that deep. The use of Super Sentai suits not seen in Power Rangers also proved to be a much fan anger. The hype leading up to Legendary Battle was dying somewhat, but by the time it came, it was visually impactful at the time with new footage, but the rush of it being at the end of the season made the whole moment last less than 5 minutes instead of a whole episode's worth, which definitely was a huge problem. Another big thing was that the returning cast of Rangers in Legendary Battle, really all of them were from a previous Saban era seasons. They had a Neo Saban era stuff like Emily and Mike from Megaforce who didn't speak. Like those guys were in the last season and you didn't give them a single line in this? Damon, Lost Galaxy, didn't speak either. The backlash was so bad that they had to edit the two final episodes of the season together, adding 43% more new scenes, whether it's some new dialogue, action, or an astronomer reference, and would air it on Nicktoons. In my opinion, that probably wasn't the best move they could have done. To be honest, I think they could have aired the final two episodes combined, like that new version on Nicktoons, and just aired that on Nickelodeon. They didn't really do that, uh, and th 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 that's bad. That was horrible. We didn't like it. Fans hated it. Like Nicktoons was a premium channel, so a lot of kids just completely missed out on it. I did myself. And most of these past Ranger cameos were subjected to just the legendary battle at the end of the season. The two callback episodes with actors were Samurai and Jungle Fury, but neither of them lived up to fan expectation. You never seen a Ranger order a Froyo before? Oh, hell no. Jaden would just show up for like a message. Mentor G was in that episode too. And Casey had probably the best of the episodes because he was training some of the rangers, but it turns out he was just like a mirage and like didn't exist. <laughs> Definitely comparing the show to Go Kaiger doomed the season from the beginning. Because they had more returning actors, old music, redos of old graphics, something that the Power Rangers team just didn't have the budget, time, or care for considering they were all the way in New Zealand while a lot of these actors were from California. And among the issues were complaints about the cast character developments, especially considering the Red Ranger's strange obsession with the previous season 6 Ranger, Robo Knight. However, in more recent years on places like Twitter, you can see a growing fan base of people who actually care about the show and the cast, which is definitely a nice turnaround. And for a show all about old Power Rangers, the marketing wasn't hitting at all. There was Morphin Madness and online polo fans picking their favorite rangers to make into a 5 pack of ranger keys that a winner would win. There was a skit where Robo Knight would wash the ranger suits. So that's where he was all season, alright I get it, I get it. There's a collab with the game Monkey Quest, they did those for other seasons too but they just had the rangers suits as skins. Does anybody actually remember that game? They also had a mediocre 3DS game with some ranger key usage as well. At least Johnny on Bosch, MMPR Black, was doing some voice acting here, though. And of course, we had the Swag Force. 
What is this? Is this a samurai thing that you just forgot to public to make public on YouTube? This isn't even Mega Force. Mega Force related. What's going on? Looks like you're fresh out of swag. That the same that I'm slept on got dreams I can rest on. The label can just step on. That's what I'm talking about. And of course, we had the Macy's Parade, which they performed with the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. This was also the franchise's last performance at the parade, as from 2015 until 2019, they would use a red balloon of the Mighty Morphin Red Ranger to promote the new series, and no in-suit people were present. Beyond the show, though, the toy line was also something of big controversy. As the Ranger Keys were much smaller than fans expected, at least compared to the Japanese versions. However, our version of the key did have an auto flip feature with a spring. They also had QR codes on the back where you can scan on the Super Mega Force app. That app doesn't exist anymore. Also, Bandai of America just didn't release packs of all the Rangers in time of 2014. It took them until 2016 at the end of the next Power Ranger series for them to properly release all the Ranger Keys that they could. It is true that Gokaiger sold keys after its run, of course, but it was primarily for new heroes, as that series sold packs of five Ranger keys of whole teams, something America could never do. And you know, there, there could have been chances of them releasing like what, 7-Eleven Gashapon type keys or have them released in a McDonald's Happy Meal, but they did none of that. It was a really bad strategy. But what was happening in 2015 and 2016? Power Rangers Dino Charge. The team was revealed during a promo that premiered right after a disappointing legendary battle. Fan reaction was initially well received, immediately looking better after seeing what fans just saw. And when this was announced in 2014, it was the first Power Ranger season to completely skip and not adapt a season of Super Sentai, that being Spy Theme 2012 Tokume Sentai Go Busters, to instead adapt Juden Sentai Kuryuger. It was also the first Ranger team to have 10 Rangers in there, and it was great because the two season model really did have a good chance to give some character development to everybody. Except not everybody did get their character development though. There was also a new theme song for the show too, still having the GoGo Power Rangers chorus of course, but at least we had something new here. There was also some retconning of stuff like dinosaur related history from Dino Thunder and Mighty Morphin, but that all makes sense soon, not really. In prehistoric times, an alien entrusted 10 powerful Energems to 10 dinosaurs, and they were lost with their extinction. Now an intergalactic bounty hunter seeks to reclaim the Energems and destroy Earth. While the first season was considered a recent fave of the community, featuring the return of original villains with Sledge, alongside the original mentorish dude, Keeper, which by the way, not really the best mentor, ever. There was also fan favorite characters from the start, including Caveman Yoda, the stand couple of Chase and Riley, Shelby, and where's my dad, Tyler? Where's my dad? I'm all alone. I'm too small to be here on my own. The second season of Dino Supercharge was the season that didn't really stuck the landing though. Even though it had the introduction of fan favorite villain Heckle, who was perceived to be the next Dark Ranger and never morphed, alongside the finale that sent Earth into a black hole and Dino Charge into a whole separate universe. <sighs> What a doozy, but hey, Sledge, the best villain ever. Throw up your hands, having fun in Japan, just fun, fun, fun. The toy line was also interesting, trying to continue the iPhone scanning of QR codes, the Dino Charge were also another smaller yet fun toy line. They even made their own fossil versions, animation, and legendary ones for other teams. However, of course, not as possible as the Ranger Key passed. There was also this iPhone game called Dino Charge Rumble. It looks very empty and rushed. How far have we fallen in game design these days? And YouTube videos were just Q&As and Snapchat videos. Oh, we're having so much fun. Oh yeah. Guys, uh... Wow, very 2016. Uh, how about that X double XL freestyle, huh? Rolling on my wrist, uh, rolling on my beat, dirty on my waist. What? Their swag is too strong. Switch the beat. Also, here's something I found interesting. Red and Pink Rangers joined the Rockettes for a musical. Does anybody have footage of that? Did that even happen? Is that a dream? We're done with jumping and shooting. Shark Boga! Just kidding, it'll never die. But you know what's stronger than the marketing of Power Rangers in the 2010s? The E Squad! Subscribe and notification bell to join the E Squad today, the world's biggest growing Power Rangers fan base in the whole entire world. 
I love you guys so much. E Squad comment of the day. Leave a funny comment down below. Put the E Squad in it, and you might be in the next video. Who knows? We're back. Now that's calligraphy. But 2016 also bought us something big for the Power Rangers franchise, and that being its own comic book line. The Boom Studios Power Ranger line definitely made a significant impact on the franchise during the 2010s, and it's something that's still felt today. Launching with Mighty Morphin Power Rangers and Go Go Power Rangers soon after, these comics redefined the Rangers world by providing a more mature and a layered narrative. Being written by the likes of Kyle Higgins and Ryan Parrott, these series offered in-depth character exploration as well as intricate storylines for the Rangers to follow, having the 90s Rangers in modern day. The standout event being Shattered Grid in 2018, crossing over multiple Ranger generations past and present, all tying with a new evil version of Tommy Oliver, becoming a milestone in comic book storytelling for Power Rangers. Here we go, movie! And it's time. He said it! He said it! To set things right. Oh, come on! The comics have also helped give light to Ranger teams never before seen in a TV show, like the Solar Rangers or the Omega Rangers. And that Boom Studio comic definitely combined that nostalgia for something fresh and made something that all Power Ranger fans could love, even when the show was flopping and being horrible. It really showed the Power Rangers and what they can do beyond just a television screen. But you know what's also beyond a television screen? A movie screen. Yes, the Power Rangers movie, Saban's Power Rangers 2017, that was happening too. It was announced in 2014 and originally had writers Ashley Miller and Zach Stenz of X-Men First Class and Thor, with Roberto Orsi, screenwriter for Transformers and Star Trek movies as well, as an executive producer. However, things would fall apart as there was no firm script. Max Landis of Chronicle made a script too that wasn't approved. And ultimately, Dean Israelite of Project Almanac was on board to direct with writers Matt Zama and Burke Sharpless. Looking back on it, maybe not the best decision. Those guys made more books. And they're making Madam Web too. So, woo! In 2015, we had cast announcements alongside some photos. In 2016, bought us the reveal of Elizabeth Banks as Rita and Brian Canston straight off of Breaking Bad as Zordon, and a funny Bill Hader as Alpha 5. Okay. We even had Jason David Frank and Amy Jo Johnson, original Power Rangers cameo in the film as well. I remember rumors back then too that they were gonna have the Dino Charge Rangers show up from like another universe. That would have been a laughing stock. That would have never happened. A lot was definitely done to promote this film. I remember going to New York Comic Con back in 2016 and watching that Power Rangers panel. That was crazy. They even had these like coins, these gold coins. Where's my coin? They had some toy con exclusives from Bandai as well as a whole toy line to go along with the movie as well. That I ultimately bought on Amazon not a few years later for $3. A six pack of figures by the way, no, no beer. They made a fake Angel Grove High School blog. They had a Boom Studios tie-in comic. They had a Qualcomm virtual reality app shown at CES. Why? Was this anything revolutionary? Not necessarily. They also had the whole cast do a collab with the YouTube channel Dude Perfect, and even had another dance video. Oh no, not again. Oh no, please, not again. Also, we can't mention the 2017 movie without talking about Krispy Kreme. Yes. Krispy Kreme, the whole joke of the 2017 Power Rangers movie was how much they were promoting Krispy Kreme to the movie. Capitalism, what level of capitalism is this? This is ridiculous. This is a Krispy Kreme. Krispy Kreme. That's where the Zeo Crystal was. We had to, of course, have Rita biting into that donut. There were verbal mentions of Krispy Kreme all over the film, and Krispy Kreme seems to be the only place in Angel Grove with the brand name on it. But I gotta admit, those donuts... That collab was fire. When are we bringing those back, man? I need that back. The movie ultimately made $85.4 million in the US and Canada, alongside 57 million in other territories, making it a total of 142.3 million. Wow, nice. But that was against a budget of over $100 million. Despite the movie being a bomb though, it was the launch platform for video games like the mobile game Legacy Wars and the console game Battle for the Grid, fighting games that comprised of many Ranger characters throughout history, all with their own online community and still receiving updates into the 2020s. 
This further expanded with a short film called Street Fighter Showdown, which featured the return of Tommy Oliver as the Green Ranger and Gia the Yellow Megaforce Ranger as they cross over with the Street Fighter universe, with characters like Ryu and Chun-Li who get their own ranger forms and they fight against mind-controlled rangers in it too. So apparently the film studio Lionsgate lost 74 million dollars, right? They can't turn this into another Hunger Games with these numbers. So, no sequel. <laughs> Toy sales weren't good either, so Power Rangers was actually really in a bad spot uh, after 2017 and beyond. So for the season after Dino Charge, it was time to skip another Sentai, that being the Animal Sentai Juoger, instead going for Shuriken Sentai Nin Ninja to become Power Rangers Ninja Steel. And off the bat, for the rest of the show, I mean, they were just trying to grab fans there with some cast lore. Power Rangers Ninja Steel cast was revealed at the 2016 Power Morphicon, a trend that had started years before with the Samurai Rangers introducing the Megaforce cast, alongside the Super Megaforce cast introducing the Dino Charge cast, all in suit, of course. Are you a fan of Turbo? Get out! And it obviously was a nice moment for fans, especially that one Power Morphicon where we had Yoshisu Darso, the Blue Ranger of Dino Charge, reading his card of the cast member to announce to find out that his brother, Peter Sudarso was the Blue Ranger for Ninja Steel, and he's been hiding it for him for a long time, and they had some big hugs and emotional moments, and it was really great for fans. But it wasn't special for just that. We had a big oopsie because we had another Yellow Ranger, Chance Simpson. Remember that guy, huh? When they went to New Zealand, he was quickly replaced by another Yellow Ranger, Nico Greetham. Recasts are normal in Power Rangers. That actually happened with the pilot, uh, Trini. It was a different actress, Audrey Dubois, before being replaced by Toy Trang. But well, to being revealed with the cast, to them being kicked out, uh, no reason was really said to the public, but it definitely was interesting. While champion Galvanax claimed the ninja's nexus star, Earth's greatest ninja sacrificed himself to keep the universe safe. Years later, a new team has risen to protect the power stars, but three stars have yet to be pulled from the prism. Who will be chosen next? You guys like my narrator voice? I got that from the Ranger Wiki. This season features Galaxy Warriors, an in-universe intergalactic game hosted by the villains, where they send a monster off to destroy the Rangers. In TBH, that's a pretty nice concept. The cast, eh, not so much. We had another lost dad syndrome with the Red Ranger. Yeah, nah, yeah. But we gotta add something to that. How about some lost brother energy? Yeah! After a little robot was my brother's storyline too. Very interesting. But hey, the sixth ranger, guitar, he sings music. No burger morpher though. No song being released. That's all dandy. But you know what's not dandy? Fans hated Victor and Monty. Yeah, they tried to revive the bulk and skull dynamic, but Samurai did this better only six years prior, and these guys totally held the story off with their fart jokes and whatnot. They're totally in love though, I think. We also had a ranger couple in there. They were just holding hands. We're really going back in time, folks. We did have some cool characters though, like Redbot, the assistant robot, whose suit is actually made from the suit of the Sentai Mecha, with a different head, of course. We also had Mick, played by longtime Ranger actor Kelson Anderson, who was the mentor, but also another Red Ranger for the team as well. And we had some more interesting moments, including a princess with battleizer armor, ninja training suits that became toys. But this definitely was a slow point for the Power Rangers, even having its own rebrand for the second half of Ninja Steel, completely, you know, disregarding the Ninja Steel name and just focusing on Power Rangers. Then, of course, there was the big 25th anniversary special, Dimensions in Danger, a slightly better version of Legendary Battle, also returning Tommy with a few ranges from Legendary Battle, but also some new ones from the Disney era. <laughs> Took you long enough. Tommy's return also had a new Master Morpher, which he can battle off these new robot clones of the Power Rangers. They even had a comic book storyline called Soul of the Dragon to go along with it as Tommy's last battle. However, this was sadly JDS last appearance on the show before his death, but truthfully, this was a great way to send off the character. But that was all until, you know, they trapped him in Robo Rita's lair as a Lenny Collection figure. That was sad. Come on, Hasbro. <gasps> Hasbro. 2017 also bought us Power Rangers Hyperforce, a tabletop role-playing game series set in the Power Rangers universe and streamed on the Twitch platform. As a joint creation from Saban Brands and Hyper RPG, it features a new team of Power Rangers played by various internet celebrities, and led by a new Red Ranger played by the popular Power Rangers alumni, Peter Sudarso. 
Paul Schreier, who also played bulky Power Rangers, was here too as the new Yellow Ranger. The show employed improvisation and dice rolls to guide the story along, allowing for a unique and interactive fan experience. And although it didn't directly impact the TV series canon, Hyperforce definitely expanded the franchise's storytelling possibilities, engaging fans through live gameplay and social media interaction. Its release in the late 2010 showcased the franchise's adaptation into new formats beyond traditional television, illustrating how Power Rangers can really be versatile in evolving engagement strategies with its new audience. But here we go, 2018, man, big year, because Hasbro bought the Power Rangers toy license. And they would take it from the original toy maker of Bandai America, the of course original toy maker since 1993 and beyond too as Bandai has done Super Sentai 2 in Japan. However, quickly after in May, they bought the whole franchise for $522 million in stocks and cash. So Saban definitely did get his payday on that one, but at what cost? During this time of them taking the franchise, Hasbro and Saban decided to do the unthinkable, that is adapting a skit Super Sentai series, that being Togume Sentai Go Busters. After longtime series runner Chip Lynn brushed dust off an old pitch he made years ago, alongside executives liking the leather costumes, the different looking zords and weapons, the world of Go Busters was a great way to start this new era. There was even a new logo with the MMPR lightning bolt that played to the soft reboot. And so at Power Morphicon 2018, they bought this new cast of Power Rangers out there, showing off the suits, how the Rangers looked, and of course the new toy line replacing the legacy collection that they've been doing for uh, five or so years now with the Lightning Collection. Brand new figure line that is in line with the rest of Hasbro's figures. The show would premiere in 2019 with a new time, moving from 12 p.m. Saturdays to 8 a.m. Saturdays, a much earlier time. Kind of a death sentence, to be honest. Who is up at 8 a.m.? Not me. I wake up at, 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 at least like 10. A secret agency known as Grid Battle Force would use Morph X with animal DNA to create its own team of Power Rangers, who are tasked to fight off an evil sentient computer virus known as Evox. And this series was generally liked, you know, taking some steps in a new direction, but it kind of still had that grasp of Saban that, you know, there was rules to be following a Power Rangers show, like comedy duos, not linking episodes to each other, no two-parters. So it definitely did feel very limited, but I can tell they at least tried. There was fan favorites like Villains Blaze and Roxy, the Beast Bots, and of course Steel were the highlights of the season. But we also had Captain Chaku, an adaptation of the Japanese Space Sheriff, and also the three-part Dino Crossover which bought back the cast of Dino Charge along with Villain Sledge and Snide, a new Goldar Maximus, and the return of Mighty Morphin Red Ranger, Jason, his first appearance in the show since Forever Red. And of course bringing along the Mighty Morphin team and the Dino Thunder team, just in suit, no voice actors. It was bad. The season also had connections with other past seasons due to the show having its own ranger vault and using old ranger weapons in its storyline. They really did try to make it feel like one big universe. And the finale of the show really bought it up a few notches by bringing connections to 2009's apocalyptic Power Rangers RPM, with Evox being revealed as the villain from that series, Vengex, along with returning recurring characters seen throughout the season like Dr. K and Colonel Truman. And Santa Claus, who was played by that same guy who played the mob boss in RPM. I'm starting to think that Mob Boss is actually Santa Claus. You never see both of them in the same room. But Hasbro didn't really give Power Rangers that big promo boost that Saban did eight years earlier, being buried against other brands like Transformers and My Little Pony. We got what? A Play-Doh crossover, My Little Pony crossover, a Nerf gun. Yeah, not really too crazy. But they weren't putting Power Rangers front and center in a new audience, and we're still very much a long way from that point. On the toy end of it all, they dropped the Zord Builder stuff from before with a new Zord Link system, which definitely was confusing. And these toys were much more expensive and didn't really hit for Ranger fans. They did make their own gimmick with Morph X keys though, which were implemented in the show, but they didn't really find that balance between the show and the toys. Hasbro still has a lot to learn. And moving to the 2020s and beyond, Hasbro is trying to separate Power Rangers from its Japanese origins and try to get a new reboot in process. But maybe that's another story for the end of the decade. That was Power Rangers in the 2010s. Definitely a bumpy ride, but definitely interesting to look back on. Power Rangers would continue to shine today with shows like Dino Fury and Cosmic Fury, but nothing was like that original promo and boost from the early 2010s. But those shows would be pushed to Netflix. Nothing really hits like those old days when you would see promos on TV, everybody wearing those Halloween costumes. 
Power Rangers was definitely something special to look at in the 2010s. What was your favorite moment of the decade? Let me know in the comments down below. Thank you so much for watching this video. I really appreciate that. Follow me on Twitter, D Don Fuego. I'm also on Instagram, not Don Fuego. Have a good morning, evening, afternoon, wherever you're at. Of course, and as always, stay awesome, everybody.